All right, Matthew chapter 18. So the theme of Matthew chapter 18, as we're looking at overall themes of each chapter as we go through and we preach through verse by verse, I always want to keep the theme of the chapter. The theme of Matthew chapter 18 is offenses, and it's offenses in many different ways. But I want to explain um, a couple things before we get started, that it's, it's talking about offenses, and offenses is maybe one of those words that has lost its meaning today. Because, you know, when we hear about offense or, you know, taking offense or I'm offended and things like that, that's not what Jesus is talking about, okay? Jesus is talking about someone who's committed an offense against someone, all right? He's committed a crime, he's done someone wrong, he's done something wrong, you know, not this... Um, this offended or this offense that we have today, right? I mean, this, it's, it's such a loose um, term today, it, it's hard to even describe. We'll get into it a little bit. But I want to say that at first. The overall theme of the, of the chapter is Jesus' uh, definition of the word offense. Let's get right into it. And right away we see in Matthew chapter 18, in verse number 1, we see, you know, God's view uh, towards children here. And the Bible says in Matthew 18:1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus first, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And, you know, so basically the first thing Jesus does is before he answers this question is he calls a little child over there. I mean, the first thing we notice here is that the children were there. Amen. Okay, so, I mean, there's your family integrated church right there. Okay, the children were not you know, at home with a babysitter or somewhere else or with, you know, in children's church or whatever. They were right there and they were listening to Jesus. And he says, you know, just bring one of these children over here. And he's going to use this to teach um, an object lesson. He's going to teach, he's using this as a teachable moment as we, as we um, learned on Sunday morning. So Jesus says, um, you know, they asked, who's the greatest? And in verse 3 he says, and, I, and said, after he grabs this child, and he brings this child over to him. He says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as the little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever there shall for humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he's speaking about the child in the sense that this child is humble and is not you know, um, all filled with his own ideas and all this kind of thing. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in Matthew chapter 19, but I want to get right into... Um, the next verse here, and we'll table that one for now until next week. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, shall you know, in my name receiveth me. Now when I see this verse right here, I think about, you know, Jesus is basically talking about his affection towards children and the way, you know, he feels strongly towards children. And we'll see that throughout um, this chapter, especially at the beginning. But when I think of verse number five, I think of like adoption, right? Someone who's adopted a child, right? A child who's you know, mother or father, you know, gave them up or died or couldn't take care of them or whatever, or, you know, maybe in bad cases of neglect or abuse or whatever. Um, someone who's adopted that child and decided that they would raise that child themselves as their own. And Jesus says, whosoever does that, you know, they, they do that to me. They receive me. Okay. And verse number six, you know, so we're seeing a coin here. So we see one side of the coin in verse number five. We're going to see the other side of the coin in verse number six. He's talking in verse number five about these people that would, that would take in a child and that's not even their own. That's not even their own and raise that child, receive that child as their own. I, I've met a lot of people like this in, you know, just not to derail the sermon, we met a lot of people like this in our life. And, you know, we did foster care um, for several years in Texas. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying one thing or another about the foster care system, but we've met several people that um, adopted children in, in our lives. And these people, um, they adopt these children and they raise them. I mean, they're their children. You know, and the people that do that, you know, they give, especially the Christian parent that does that, you know, th there's going to be some serious rewards for those people. Because they're saving that child in so many different ways, spiritually and, you know, physically on this earth. So that's, um, that's a huge blessing to that child. And Jesus here is saying, I'm going to take care of these people. Okay? Now look at the flip side of the coin in verse number six. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. So he says, you know, he doesn't say that we should take these people and put a millstone around their neck and throw them in the water. He says it would be better if that happened to them, because when I get them, 
is what Jesus is saying. Okay? And in verse number 7, he says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. So, you know, why? Why? Why must it... I mean, he's talking about someone who would commit an offense against the child, commit violence against the child here. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying, you know, woe unto that person. It would be better if they were killed because I'm going I'm to torture them and, and suffer. They're going to suffer forever when I get them. Okay? But he says it, it, it needs that they come, that these offenses come. Why? What you're seeing here in verse number 7 is, you know, look, we have to compare free will. We have to take both sides. Okay? God didn't create a bunch of robots on this planet that are just pre-programmed to just, you know, um, worship him no matter what. Okay? We have this thing called free will, and we have these things in our life called choices. And while all of you have chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, there's the vast majority of the world who will not make that choice on their own. No one's stopping them from making that choice. And here, he's showing, you know, on one hand we have the saved, you know, believer, and on the other hand, we have the person that's totally rejected God, that's, the, uh, that's just the spectrum of free will. So that's why it must come. Because God wants us to, you know, follow the Bible and believe on His Son and then, you know, follow the commandments of the Bible to show that we love Him. He wants, you, want, you know, you want your children to follow you, to follow your commandments because they love you. Not because you're some, you know, Nazi dictator that just tells them exactly what to do or you're just going to you know, punish them. I mean, you want them to follow you freely. Okay? And that's what God has created here, and that's the choice that everyone has. But what we're seeing here and what Jesus is talking about is the dark side of free will. The dark side of free will. Look, some people, turn to Romans chapter 1, some people will reject God. I mean, think about you know, child abuse. Look, I don't like talking about this stuff. Okay? It's, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing to even think about. But we need to be aware of it. Okay? Turn to Romans chapter 1. You know, the Bible, let's just start reading in, in verse number 25. I mean, we know Romans chapter 1 very well, but God is describing this process that can happen to someone in Romans chapter 1. And in Romans 21, it says, you know, these people, they knew, they knew God, but they glorified Him not as God. It said they became vain. It says their heart was darkened. But you see, it's because they rejected God first. And look at verse number 25. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25, these people who changed the truth of God into a lie. So they've rejected God. Now they're changing His truth into a lie. They're changing His word. They're changing what He said. Isn't that what Satan did at the very beginning? And worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I really want you to focus on the word nature and unnatural in Romans chapter 1. Because we really need to understand it, especially with the way our society is going. Okay? Which is against nature. Verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. So we see here that a man and a woman being together is natural. That is what is natural. The Bible says it. Look, there's no gray here. Okay? The natural use. They burned in lust towards one another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meat. This is talking about the homosexual. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That means He, re they, he gave them over to a rejected mind. That means that people that got to this point, that were rejected at this point, is like their mind will, will, will come up with things that a natural mind will not. Being filled. And then He, he gets more detailed for us. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things. There's that reprobate mind. There's that re rejected mind. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. Here it is again. Without what? without natural 
affection. Implacable and, here's, the, here's a big word. I mean, think about it. Who would hurt a child? What normal person would hurt a child? What, whether it be in, in some, you know, bad, you know, sick, or just a violent way. What normal person would hurt a child? Someone who has no mercy. Someone who is unmerciful. As the Bible tells us right here. Has no mercy at all. Because look, I mean, look, God is telling us here that bad things, but what I want to point out is that it is not a natural thing. Because we all have this law written in our hearts, it is not a natural thing to want to hurt an innocent child. Something has happened to somebody that would do that. Something has changed that person from a natural person to an unnatural person. It's much more than just homosexuality. I mean, it's all of the hundred and whatever there are now of these unnatural categories that are out there. Because look, all we have to know is that there's only one natural category. And that is a man who is married to a woman and, and is normal. It doesn't mean you're saved. It means you, you have natural affection. That you still have that conscience and you haven't seared that conscience to the point where God has rejected you. Literally rejected you. So look, Jesus here is telling us that these people exist. Okay? And look, we need to remember this. Turn to Proverbs chapter 17. We need to remember this. There's all sorts of these unnatural people out there. And, and, God, and Jesus is telling us that, look, I will take care of it. In the end, I will take care of it. But I'll tell you what, he's telling us this in the Bible also because we're not going to be these head-in-the-sand Christians. Amen. Because we still have responsibility on this earth to understand what's happening around us. Right. And to protect the ones that we love, to protect the innocent that can't protect themselves, to protect our children. Amen. To protect the church. Amen. Look at Proverbs 17. Look, God hates injustice. Yep. He hates it. In Proverbs 17, look at verse 15. And the Bible says it, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. The Lord says that if you justify these people, you're an abomination too. Amen. There's no gray. There's no gray. These unnatural, you know, sodomites and all the other categories, they're all an abomination to the Lord, the Bible says. And if you justify them, you're an abomination too. God hates injustice. And God says, I'll take care of it, but we need to be aware of it, folks. Okay? Matthew 18, look at verse number 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast out into hellfire. Well, so you're saying, okay, is this literal? All right, well, look, here's the thing. You might be surprised. Works do not save you, we know that. Okay? But look, there are sins that could keep you from getting saved if you're not saved. Right? Go up here, come here sometime during the week and visit the church when one of these um, drug addicts is out here sleeping on the sidewalk, and let's try to give him the gospel together. That sin will keep that person from getting saved. You see, if you're tied up in sins, and you're unsaved, and you're tied up in certain sins, there, it's very possible that a lifestyle of sin could keep you from getting saved. It's not the sin that, that the, the works that save you, it, but that sin could be keeping you from the truth. Amen. Right? When you're not in your right mind, when you've, when you've melted your mind, to the point where there's no way you can even understand the gospel anymore? You would have been better off cutting off your arms than using them to shoot up drugs into. For sure. Okay? 
So look, we, I'm sure we meet people like this all the time. I'm sure, look, I'm sure we meet people at the door, we want to give the gospel to them, and their life is just so great that they don't want to have anything to do with us. Why do you think when we go to nice neighborhoods, it's harder to get people saved? I mean, these people, they're, they're wrapped up in, in the thorns of this world, and I'm sure they're wrapped up in sins as well, and they like those sins. They don't want to give up that life. I mean, what do you have to tell me? I'm having fun here. You know, I'm having fun going out to the, the fancy bars and all the fancy places that I go and do all the, the, the fancy sin that I do. I don't want to have anything to do with what you're saying. What, I'm supposed to separate myself from the world? I'm supposed to, you know, live this Christian life? You know, even though that doesn't have to do with salvation, they're not interested because, you know, they're wrapped up in sin. So, yeah, it, it could be literal is what I'm saying. It could work that way. All right, look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 10. Sin can get a hold of people, period. Look at Matthew 18 and verse number 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. Now he's back on the children. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You ever heard of guardian angels? Amen. Here they are. Here they are in the Bible. Matthew 18, verse 10 is talking about guardian angels. Turn to Psalm 34. He's saying that, look, these, these children, these children uh, that, you know, they have angels in heaven that are, that are witnessing to the Father about them. So here we have the guardian angels. Look at Psalm 34 and verse number 7. The Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Psalm 91, 11. I'll just read it for you. You turn to Hebrews chapter 1. The Bible says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. <coughs> this idea that we have angels looking over us is biblical. The Bible tells us right here that we have angels looking over us. That we have angels watching us. Look, so... You know, don't, God doesn't just say, hey, don't be afraid of anything, just fear me only. He's like, I've given you these angels to look after you. Amen. You have guardian angels. I mean, have you ever read the description of angels in the Bible, of Michael the archangel? I mean, that's who I want standing next to me Amen. when I'm soul winning in some rough neighborhood. That's why I'm not too worried about things. Amen. But look, it's biblical. Look at Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So look, especially if you're saved, the Bible says you have an angel watching over you. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 15. This is one of the coolest stories um, that, that I like in the Bible regarding angels. But look at 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 15. The Syrian army has just invaded, and Elisha and his servant comes up to him, and he's all scared, and he's like, ah! He's like, they're going to get us, you know? And Elisha's just like, settle down, son. He's like, let me show you what the score really is. And look at 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 15. And the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth. Behold, an host compassed the city. That means an army compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. So Elisha saw this already. And Elisha prays that you would show the servant what I see, Lord. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So look, God has angels, he has armies of angels, he can protect you throughout anything that is going to happen, no matter what. And here he's telling us that, that children, you know, have an angel in heaven watching over them and, wit and testifying to the Father um, for their situation, okay? So look, especially if you're saved, you have an angel watching over you. Look at verse number 11 of Matthew chapter 18, we have to kind of get moving here. The Bible says, For the Son of Man is to save that which is lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seek that which is gone astray? And if it so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth, rejoiceth more of, of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. 
Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So look, he's still talking about the kids here, okay? But look, turn to John 3.16. Turn there, because you probably don't have it memorized. I'm just kidding. John 3.16. Look, what he's, I, I find it interesting that he says that, that he doesn't want one of these little ones to perish, right? It is not the will of the Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should what? Not perish. So when I'm out soul winning and I explain what that actually means, not perish means you'll never go to hell. You'll never get the second death. You know, we've already explained the second death at this point, right? So look, God doesn't want, this is proof that God wants all people to be saved. Look, He wants all children to be saved. Look, He doesn't want any children to go to hell. The Bible says, look, He has seen, look, he has seen us all as children. If you're here as an adult, God has seen you as a child. And look, even though, even those children that He rejected later in their life, at one time He loved them. The, the worst person, the, the, the Jeffrey Dahmer, at one time, God loved that child. But something happened to him. Go back to Romans chapter 7. Look at Romans chapter 7. And look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So before these children knew the law, they were innocent. And then when the law came in and they, they understood the law, and they had that law written in their hearts, and they understood that law, sin revived and they died. Now they need to be saved. Now they need to be saved. But here's the problem. Those little ones become big ones. These children grow up. The, they grow up to be the people that we talk to every week. And how many, for a variety of different reasons, how many of these children are going to get saved? Not many. It's sad. And look, the more society rebels against God in the Bible, the worse it's going to get. There's going to be fewer and fewer of these children that get saved. So Jesus says, you know, suffer the little children. We'll talk about that in Matthew chapter 19. But the worst thing, look, a child that is, you know, has offenses committed against him and then maybe it grows up to you know, reject God for whatever reason. These, these children that grow up and they don't believe. And, and some children grow up to hate God. The worst thing that could ever happen to a child is they never get saved. The, of all the things that you could think of, horrible things happening to children, the worst thing that could, never ha that could happen to a child is that they never get saved. And the worst that society gets... So you think that it's, you know, you think about the worst type of people out there, but really just raising a child to not know the Bible and to not know who their Lord and Savior is, is child abuse in itself. Because the worst thing that could happen to them is that they never get saved. And we know, unfortunately, we know the truth that most of them won't get saved. I, I wish I could report better news to you. Now we shift, shift gears in the chapter. Jesus changes topics a little bit here. Look at verse 15. He talks about forgiving your brother. And he talks about relationships with your brothers and sisters in the church and just one-on-one. -on -one. And in verse 15, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So he's going to give you a methodology on how to deal with conflict here. If he shall hear it, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let, it be, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So here we see proper methods for dealing with conflict. So this, this gets rid of your, you know, talking behind people's back right here. He's like, hey, if somebody, you got a problem with somebody, somebody's wronged you, just go tell them. Say, hey man, you wronged me. Hey, you know, 
miss, you wronged me. And, and look, in that context, he goes into verse 18, and he says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two or three shall gather on earth as touching anything that ye shall ask, it shall be done for any of them of, them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, I skipped over this in Matthew 16. Did anyone catch that? I kind of skipped over this whole topic. Okay, but we're going we're gonna to cover it now. Because I have to kind of make decisions. This comes up in different points of the Bible. I have to decide when to fight my battles here, right? So, look, this is a very interesting uh, concept. So, basically what he's done in Matthew 18 here, he's just given you uh, how to handle conflict in the church. So, if somebody offends me, if Brother Trevor, you know, does something wrong to me, I borrow my car, and he goes and he smashes it up into a pole or something like that. And he's like, man, here's your keys, man. Your car's all wrecked. Have a nice day. You know, and then, you know, I, he tells, I'm to go to him and say, look, man, you ruined my car. And you, sh you should, you know, you should make that right. And if he's like, forget you, man, I don't like your car, it was ugly. And I'm like, well, I know, but now it's even uglier. Brother, help me out here. What do I do? Then I go and I get Brother Ryan and Brother Matthew, and I say, look, man, he wrecked my car. And then Brother Matthew and Brother Ryan said, but your car was garbage anyway. But I'm like, yeah, but still, he wrecked my car. Right? And then we go to him and he still doesn't, he's still like, forget you and your Ford Fusion, man. He's like, I'm a Chevy guy. He's not. I'm sorry. I've offended you. All right. <laughs> but my point is, at that point, we take it to the church. Right? We take it before the church. And if he still doesn't, uh, you know, admit his fault, then he's to be put out as, as an heathen man. Okay? And that's, that's your church discipline right there. Okay? And then God, in that context, look at Matthew 16, 19. God said this again. He said this, Jesus said this to Peter in chapter 16, talking about in the same context of the church on earth. And he says to Peter, he says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see that same that same wording used in Matthew chapter 18 when it's talking about how to deal with interpersonal conflicts in the church. And what God is saying here is he's saying, hey, if you follow this process, whatever you guys do, whatever you bind, if you throw Brother Trevor out for wrecking Brother Jared's car, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor that in heaven. You know, he's also under the scrutiny of God at that point. God agrees with that judgment is what he's saying. God is giving us rules on how to prosecute it, and then he's saying, if you prosecute it that way, I, I, you know, I will keep it. I will agree with it. Okay? So it's talking about the context of the church in both cases. It's church discipline in chapter 18, and if the church follows that procedure, God will honor the decision. It's, it's really that simple. Okay? Now look, this is taken too far in several different religions. I mean, when I grew up as a Lutheran, this was called, the Matthew 16 was called the office of the keys. Right? I mean, so like, look, I am the leader of this satellite church, and if I was the pastor, it would work even better. But I'm the leader of this satellite church. God has given me the keys, and I have this office of the keys. And look, whatever I say is pretty much the same as God. I can forgive your sins, or I can not forgive your sins. And you have to confess your sins to me. That's the Catholic priest right there. It's the office of the keys, folks. They, they, they take this verse, and they just, I mean, they take it, and they like... They, they tuck that football and they run, right? I mean, they're gone. So, I mean, but look, it's, it's somebody who's after power and control, it's perfect, right? I mean, look, I can forgive your sins. My birthday is coming up next week. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just saying, I have the power over everything. Okay? So, but look, all God is saying here, all Jesus is saying, is that here's, the, here's how you deal with people in church. Here's how you deal with someone who's offended and committed an offense. And he's, 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 giving you, he's giving them rules on how to deal with each other. And he's saying, follow these rules, and you know, I, I, will, I will honor that, that judgment. That's what he's saying. Okay? You know, I'm the vicar of Christ on earth. That's a good one. I mean, if you're going to think of something... To, to control people. I mean, that's a good one. I mean, pretty much my words are the same as Christ's words. You got it? I mean, way too far, right? Heretics, they're all going to pay for that stuff. All right. Matthew 18, look at verse number 20. 
Once again, same theme for that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He's like, look, I'm with you if you follow this. That's what he's saying, all right? Matthew, uh, now he talks about one-on-one -on -one relations, okay? Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus says, on seven times, but 70 times seven, right? Therefore, in the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he began to reckon, one was brought to him, which owed him 10,000 talents. And we've taught, we've preached to this before. So basically, this guy, he owes 10,000 talents, and he's going to be sold, and his family's going to be sold to pay, and the guy just forgives him, right? And then he goes out, he goes out, and he finds somebody after he's been freed of all his debt of 10,000 talents. He finds somebody that owes him like a dollar, and he just like beats him and all this kind of stuff, and he doesn't forget that debt. The other fellow servants, they go back and they tell the master what he did. And, you know, in verse 34, we'll just end it. I'm trying to hurry here so we can get, the, um, get to the application. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. Shall he, she should, he should pay all that was due to him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So 35 is basically the one-on-one -on -one relationship part right there. Okay? He's like... And go back to Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. And look at verse number uh, 14. This is a theme in the Bible, okay? And people, people that teach works-based salvation take this theme and they run with it too. And they use it to teach works, basically. Okay, but that's not what it's talking about. Let me just show you the theme real quick. Look at Matthew 6, 14. The Bible says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. James 2, 13 says, He shall have, ju he shall have judgment without mercy that showeth no mercy. There's, a, there's an idea, a concept being taught here, right? It says, look, if you are judgmental without mercy, I will show you no mercy. That does not mean I will take away your salvation. Different. Okay? He's talking about, look, it's a, it's a, it's a forgiveness, it's a, it's a being right with your Heavenly Father forgiveness. Look, there's a daily forgiveness that should go on in your life. You should daily confess your sins to the Lord. Amen. It's not about being saved, but you should get down on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. You know, that's your Heavenly Father you're dealing with there. That's your Heavenly Father you sin against every single day. He's never going to take away your salvation. This is about being right with your Heavenly Father. And He says, look, you want to be unmerciful to your brother? I will have no mercy with you. And if I have no mercy with my son, and every little thing I just stomp him into the ground for, it doesn't mean he's not my son. It means I'm just not having any mercy with him. And look, I want God to have mercy with me. I want God to have mercy with me. When I get down on my hands and knees and I ask for forgiveness, I want it to be like I'm going to have mercy on you. Because you had mercy on your brothers and on your sisters. Look, I want some leniency in my life. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that son who is stomped into the ground at every turn. Because I make wrong turns. And you make wrong turns. And we're going to make wrong turns as long as we have this flesh. And I don't, want to get, I don't want to get kicked in the face every single time I make a wrong turn. That's what this is about. It's a concept. You're saved. You're sealed. Done. I mean, look, this is confusing if you don't believe in eternal security. The Bible makes no sense because the Bible still teaches that you're sealed. It still teaches that, you know, I give them everlasting life and they shall never perish. It still teaches that you'll never go to hell. So then you read stuff like this, and you're like, but what, if I don't forgive Brother Trevor for wrecking my car, then I'm going to hell? It makes no sense. This is the only way you can interpret this logically. The Bible's logical. Imagine that. All right? So look, it's about being right with your Heavenly Father. All right, so look, let's apply this real quickly. Let's, let's look at this forgiveness thing. Here's the thing about this concept of forgiveness. So we see... We see that there's this, this idea in the church where there's a conflict and there's witnesses that are brought in. And then we see, you know, we see that there's this one-on-one -on -one situation. Look, at, um, look back at Matthew 18, 15. You know, look, here's the ideal situation. The ideal situation is that someone wrongs you. You bring it straight to them. You, say, I, you, you go to them and you say, brother, you know, you offended me. 
And, and by that, look, and by that, I mean you committed an offense against me. Okay, look, I, don't get me started on this whole being offended thing today, okay? You do not have the right in this country, this is separate, that you do not have the right in this country to not be offended. That is not a right that you have. But you know a right that we do have in this country? And I'm going to show you why it's important for the Bible-believing Christian. You know a right that we do have? A right that we do have is free speech. The, the, free, the freedom to assemble peaceably. Those are rights that we do have. And guess what? Certain people are going to be offended by your free speech. I mean, you don't believe me? I mean, we're actually, turn to Matthew 24. We're actually approaching a point, or we have been approaching a point in this country where people are violently protesting freedom of speech. That's where it's at right now. And justifying it by them just being offended. I'm offended. You say, what's the big deal? I'll show you the big deal right here. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 10. Or verse number 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Why? And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. Look, the Bible offends people. The Word of God offends people. And you know what? It's more and more people every day that this book offends. And soon, that will trump your free speech. Because they will get violent about it. And look, you say that's concerning, but I'm just telling you that it's coming. So don't be offended when it does come. Okay? Let's get back to the sermon. So we see this idea, back to sinning against your brother. Brother, you owe me money or whatever. The problem usually exists in the first place because one person's heart is not right. Right? But God puts in provisions for that. That's why he says, get a brother, get another brother or sister, and now two of you confront that person. You say, you know, what if the other person's in on it too? Right? But here's the thing, and the reason that, that this works, that th God's plan works, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. I mean, God knows what he's doing. He's engineered a nice solution here. Okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 17, this is the same theory behind a jury trial that God has put in place here. Look at Deuteronomy 17 in verse number 5. The Bible says, Then shalt bring, then that, sh Ugh, can anyone read? Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he be worthy of death, be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness shall he not be put to death. So somebody that's been like convicted of a crime, like murder or something that is punishable by death, they say that only in the mouth of two or three witnesses can that person be put to death. It can't just be one person accusing them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 19, we see why this, is wor this works. Because in Deuteronomy 19, if these witnesses testify falsely, Whatever the punishment that the person that they were testifying against and they found that they, they falsely testified, they get that punishment. Yep. So if you come forth and you, you accuse me of murder and two or three of your buddies come forth and accuse me of murder and you guys were lying, you get put to death. Yep. There, that takes care of like 99.9 .9 of all your false witnesses right there. All right, so the Bible, I mean, this is, this is biblical, this two or three witnesses thing, okay? You know, Jesus is just basically, he's, he's just, he's referencing Old Testament law, all right? Now you say, I mean, this is just like a jury trial. You say, trial, why, a why 12? Well, there was, the reason, it's not in the Bible, a, a, a jury of 12, but the reason for jury trials being 12 people is because, you know, there's 12 tribes of Israel. There was 12 um, spies that went into the land. There was 12 apostles that testified of Jesus. I mean, there's all these different um, reasons, and that's generally why in the 15, 1600s they think that the, the 12 number was chosen for the just information there. Okay? Turn to Romans chapter 2. But for many different reasons that are biblically based, but ultimately um, here's why it actually works. Okay, look at Romans chapter 2 and verse number 14. Here's why bringing in more witnesses actually works as far as, what do I mean by works? I mean it actually gets to the truth. 
Okay, it actually, it actually helps justice be, you know, applied. Okay, look at Romans 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. So here's the Gentiles, they're not saved. All right? But they're doing the things that are in the law. Okay? For, which show the work of the law, what? Written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You see that? So what are their, what is the, their conscience is doing what? It's accusing or excusing people. Their conscience is actually showing them the truth. Where did they get their conscience? God wrote it in their heart. So the Bible, look, the truth still has the advantage. Because look, here's the thing. Not every, I mean, the reprobates are like rejected people that have no conscience are still a very small portion of society. I think. Okay? And they're still a small portion of society. So when you have a jury of 12 people, they don't have to be saved. They still have the law written in their heart. So it works. Because God, I mean, think of them as the Gentiles. They, they didn't have the law, but they do by nature the things which are in the law. See? So that's why it works. That's why God's plan um, works for jury trials today. All right? I mean, most people are not saved, but they still have that law written in their heart. All right? They have not been given over to a reprobate mind or a rejected mind, and hopefully the interview process for the jury would, you know, uh, identify one if, if one was in there. Right? Maybe not. Who knows? All right? But look. The point is that this, this methodology of bringing two or three witnesses and then, you know, this idea of bringing them before the church, 99% of the time, this is going to solve the problem. This is going to mend the situation, okay? Because people are going to realize, oh, man, three people, you know, I, I'm not a reprobate. I'm saved. I understand what they're saying. That's most of the time going to fix the problem, okay? But there's still these personal situations in verses 21 and 22 you know, kind of think of it as a, as a last resort. But Jesus is basically saying at the last part of Matthew chapter 18, he's like, look, in the end, just let it go. Just forgive. Like, even if the guy is just unrepentant and just gets kicked out of church and, and we're supposed to not ever be around him, you yourself, who remain in the church, are to forgive. Amen. Period. Okay, so look, that one guy whose heart isn't right, let it go. Forgive. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. Right? So, I mean, really, unless you have more than one Christian whose heart is not right and willing to follow these procedures, the situation will work itself out in the church. Does that make sense? So, in order for a situation in a church to just, like, be totally out of control and we've followed these procedures, you would have to have more than one person not right with the Lord, with a, with a bad heart, right? You would have to have, you know, somebody get kicked out and then have the other person still have a bad heart and all this. I mean, but God pretty much covers it here, totally. So if we have a bad apple who's not going to get right, it, they're going to be put out. I mean, put out in the way that ho we hopefully they come back, right? So the church has some pretty good management practices here, Jesus is teaching us, right? You know, it says, let him be as a heathen man and a publican. You know, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 5. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, it's, you know, the whole point is to, you know, deliver one such, deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved. So, He's, he's to be as a heathen man and a publican, and, you know, you're not supposed to have... So, look, here's another thing. You know what it says heathen man and publican? You're, not, you're supposed to be separated from heathen men and publicans in your personal life, right? So, I mean, you're not supposed to have somebody get kicked out of the church for, you know, whatever things, and then have, like, half the church, like, hanging out with him all the time. I mean, it's supposed to be a punishment. It's supposed to be chastisement. God says in Matthew 18 that he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to chastise the situation too. He's like, I'm going to bind. If you bind it there, I'm going to bind it too. So what are you doing going out and, you know, trying to undo what God and the church has already done, yeah. right? I mean, thankfully, we've not dealt with anything like this. But, I mean, I've seen this dealt with, you know, and it's, it's a real thing. So, look, the idea is to restore these people. 
And if you're going to restore them and they come back and you're just going to hold a grudge, that's now, now it's on you. Amen. Now you're the one that's not right. So it's a perfect plan. It's a perfect plan, and here's the thing. Try coming up with a perfect plan with imperfect people. Try building a perfect machine with imperfect parts. And that's kind of what God has done here. He's promised us that, that you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Amen. So it's very important that we follow the rules that God puts forth, Amen. is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so if those days do come, just, you know, remember, you know, this is, we're going to do it right, and we're going to do it with the right heart, too. Amen. Okay? All right. So the theme of the chapter is offenses, you know, all sorts of offenses going on in a different context than all these, uh, you know, what do you call them, pansies, can you say that? <laughs> Getting offended by everything today? All right, let's bow our heads and uh, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for Matthew chapter 18. I thank you for all these great lessons that Jesus uh, taught us about how to how to handle our relationships with each other, Lord. And I just pray that you just keep everyone's heart right in this church and just, just keep blessing this church, Lord. And I thank you for this church. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, just to worship here and to just have fellowship um, with our brothers and sisters here, Lord. It's just a, it's a great privilege. Um, I don't deserve it. And I, I just appreciate it every day, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen.